Daniela, would you like to introduce with a, well, introduce, open up the space with a land acknowledgement? I would love to. Um, here in the IC, we like to open up the space and start events and presentations by doing a land acknowledgement. I am currently in Linden, Washington, and I'm on the lands of the Nooksack and Coast Salish people. We do this to be considerate and conscious of the land that we occupy and know that these lands have been violently stolen from indigenous people through broken treaties, rape, and genocide. We say this not only to acknowledge it, but to honor the people that have taken care of this time since Landon Memorial. And we know that just mentioning this isn't enough and we want to make a commitment to action and justice to make sure that we take care of these lands and that we can protect them from being exploited. Thank you. Alex, I think you're muted. Uh, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna be doing the uh, pronouns. Um, my name is Alex, I go by he, him, his. I am the student staff navigator here in the IC. Um, we would like to acknowledge that there are different pronouns that people go by. For example, uh, she, her, hers, uh, they, them, theirs. And there are other uh, pronouns um, on, the, on the net, um, which is a very long list of pronouns. So if you make a mistake by calling someone by, um, by not their write pronouns, uh, duly apologize to the person and, um, you know, show them that there's no ill will towards them. Thank you. Bree? All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Welcome to Intercultures, uh, sorry, Welcome Community Get Colleges Intercultural Center. Um, before, uh, before I let the wonderful Ibaduni Kuto, uh, Ojikuto, Ojikuto, sorry, um, uh, go. Uh, I would like to introduce her a little bit. She is a recipient of the top award in the Seattle Opera Training, Opera Guild Training Grant Competition. Not very good with the script. Obviously, I am not in the opera. Um, Ms. Ojikutu is a teaching and freelance artist with the Seattle Opera Outreach and Seattle Opera. Recent credits include her Benaroya Hall debut with uh, Showtunes Theater Company in their production of Finian's Rainbow. Ms. Ojikutu was also pleased to reprise the role of Strawberry Woman in Seattle Opera's 2018 production of Porgy and Bess, along with making her role debut as Serena in the same production. Without further ado, Miss Ibiduni Ojikutu. Actually, before she starts, I wanted to give a shout out to uh, Bellingham Public Schools, who actually partnered with us today. And um, we did mention it earlier, but it wasn't part of the recording, so I just wanted to say it again. Um, but yeah. Without further ado, Evie, what you could do? Hello, everybody. I think there are some videos that are going to be played. Yes, I'm going to take care of that for you, Evie. Awesome. Um, do you want me to introduce them or? Yeah, you are more than welcome to. Okay, I'm not quite sure what order they're going to go into, but one of them is uh, it's a performance of Easiest Life from Aida. Uh, was recorded um, at an opera on tap performance, some musical theater. And then the other one is an official recording of Strawberry Woman Scene from Porgy and Bess with Seattle Opera. Awesome. We will start with Easy as Life, and I'll make sure that that comes up. Wait, um, <laughs> when I was in college, I will say at probably about 22, I discovered Aida and my two personal Jesuses, Heather Heavy and Audrey McDonald. And I was like, I, when I'm 25, I'm gonna be in New York and I'm gonna be starring in Aida, the musical, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And then on the other days, I'm gonna go across the street to the Met and I'm gonna sing Aida at the Met. <laughs> I did not understand how New York worked. <laughs> <laughs> so. You can still do it. <laughs> this is the moment when the gods expect me to. But I won't even try. I want nothing 
in the world but myself to protect me and I won't lie down roll over and die all I have to do is forget how much I love you to one side, tell myself it loves an ever-changing situation, passion would have proved, and all the magic would have died, it's easy, it's easy. Our second video, let's pull that up. So the second one, just as she had mentioned, is the official recording of Strawberry Woman.
Well, that was fun. <laughs> um, it's always kind of hard for me to watch myself perform, but as a performer, it's definitely something that I need to get used to. Um, I chose those two pieces because they are such a vast contrast. And um, I'm gonna pin myself real quick, sorry. Um, because they are such a vast contrast and I think they kind of play to what my strengths are. You know, I have always wanted, when I was little, I said I was gonna be a rock star and an opera singer and I was gonna be on Broadway. And um, I did sing in a blues band in college. So I think maybe I've, I've, I've come pretty close to that. Um, the number one question I get from people is, how did you start singing? When did you start singing? And the answer to that is always, um, always, I've always sung. I've always made some kind of noise. You know, some of my earliest memories are of singing along with the Nutcracker tape my godmother got me. Um, my mother plays the piano. The piano that I grew up hearing is actually right around the corner. It's the only one that sounds right to my ear. And mom would play the piano and I would lie under the, the bench and play with her feet while she pedaled. Um, I come from a very musical family. My, especially on my mother's side, I have a cousin who's won Grammys and everybody in his family plays the piano or sings. My little sister played the piano, was a dancer and also played the oboe. I played the cello, piano, danced and sang. My big sister played the clarinet and the piano and danced, you know. So I come from a very, very uh, musical family. I am very fortunate that I had parents who were kind of keyed into what we were into young and made sure to expose us to as much as possible. If there was, because mom knew that I was a singer. Mom knew that I was a singer. Um, she, there is a tape of me singing The Greatest Love of All. It's about an hour of that song. I'm probably like five or six years old because I've got a little list. And if there was a black singer that was being interviewed, mom would call me in to come and watch it. Um, if there was a recital, mother would call me in to watch it. We, they took us to plays. Um, my godmother took us to ballets and we went to uh, story time with storytellers when we lived in New Mexico. So I've always, always, always had art in some way, shape or form in my life. Um, I was a, I will admit, I'm used, to, I'm used to talking to singers. So I did pose some questions to some of my friends that are not singers. And so I'll, you'll see me like glancing down and referencing these. One of the questions that I got was, what's advice that you would give five-year-old you? I was a high energy child. I apologize to my mother all the time for that because I am exhausting. Um, I was a very high energy child. I have a, and still have a wild imagination. I was constantly telling stories. I was constantly in my room, like acting out music videos and all of that, those kinds of things. And I would tell five-year-old me that you are not too much. Everybody else is not enough. The world needs to come and, and meet you where you are because there's no reason for you to try to hide your light, to try to hide your shine when there's, it's so needed in this world. Um, I, my first voice lessons, I would say, were with Whitney Houston. Um, she, for, and for a lot of singers my age and, and, you know, around my age was kind of the first time she, she was the one. Um, if you listen, I still listen to Whitney. I've had her national anthem on repeat for about a week and a half, two weeks because it's perfect. And the thing about Whitney Houston was that she knew exactly where every single part of her voice sits and how to access it. She knew how to manipulate her way through the different um, parts of her voice. And so I would listen over and over and over and over again and imitate that. And that's how I learned to work my way through parts of my voice. 
Um, it worked its way into other parts of my life. My mother asked me to clean my room once and I had been listening to Whitney and I said, no, 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 no. And she just looked at me like, who is this child? And I went and I cleaned my room. So I've always, always constantly just had music around me. Um, on top of that, we listened to a lot of Motown. I was very much into the Supremes, mostly because I thought my mother was one of the Supremes because her name was Diane and she wears lipstick and I thought only the Supremes wore lipstick. Um, opera made its way into my life. I honestly don't know exactly when. I do know, my mother took me to see Leontine Price when I was little. I don't remember it. <laughs> which is wild because I remember everything else she took me to, but she did take me to, she took us to see Leontine and apparently I was enthralled. The first time I ever was on a professional stage was in Porgy and Bess. They needed extras for production they were doing in, in Nebraska. And so we got to be on stage as extras in the opening act. And um, I was so jealous because my little sister got to actually, she had action. She got to touch a prop and she got to run around and she was tiny and cute. And I was like 13 and had to like stand and wave at everybody else. So, um, and, but before that, my mother had bought the Porgy and Bess recording that has like Lanting Price and Cab Calloway on it. And I listened to that nonstop as well and learned how to sing that way. Um, I think I kind of had a more mature voice for somebody my age. I didn't start voice lessons until I was 15, which is a great age to start. Anything younger, you know, you really need to be worried about musicality and learning how to read music and being in children's choirs and all of that kind of thing. The voice is delicate and it is the instrument that we carry around in our bodies. So um, mine is still changing. My voice is still changing. It won't fully mature probably for another couple of years. Um, so you have to be careful with it. But I would say that um, the first kind of things that I started singing were Rodgers and Hammerstein type stuff. Um, I one thing that happens to young black singers especially you know women is that sometimes you'll get a teacher who is so excited to have a black singer because they can finally have them sing something from porgy and bess so i was given summertime at a very young age to sing and i sang it for quite a while it doesn't necessarily fit my voice anymore um and and that was kind of my first kind of foray into opera before that, I was doing Rodgers and Hammerstein and some Sondheim and stuff like that. Um, when I was in college, you don't necessarily have a choice. You're gonna learn, especially the liberal arts college, you're going to be trained classically. And that is actually quite important. It's very important training because it kind of, for me, I believe, sets the foundation. Um, it is also good for students to learn other forms of, of singing because you need all of those colors to pull from when you perform. That's one thing that I'm lucky that I have is that I have such a varied kind of training and, and varied tastes in singing that I can kind of pull from all different genres if I need to. Um, I will say that the, the singer that I am now is very different than the singer I was in, in undergrad. When I was in undergrad, I was only singing arias. My teacher had to fight me to get me to sing art song. Um, and I was sneaking musical theater wherever I could get it. <laughs> now I, I do most of my singing in art song, which is bizarre to me. Um, when I was an undergrad, I did not like Benjamin Britten. I did not like Verdi. Now I'm Sing Verity and I, Britain is my guy. Like I love that kind of music and it's just because my ear changed, my ear matured and, um, and along with it, the voice matured. People ask me, how did I choose opera? And I will say that the voice chose for me. Um, something that happens when you're younger that I didn't know would happen is that your voice changes. 
my voice changed. It changes for women around 30. And then again, around 33, there's little micro changes in there. So I had been studying steadily and then I graduated from college and then my voice teacher moved the next year and I didn't have a lesson for about three, four years until the person I'm currently studying with um, came to Western and I started studying with him. And my first lesson with him, I opened my mouth and a monster came out and I called my best friend I, after the lesson. I was like, okay, it was great. You know, just contact me if you want to study again. Mm -hmm. Went around the corner, was like, ah! you know, called my best friend in tears. And I was like, it was awful. He thinks that I can't sing. I don't know what's wrong. It's a monster. I can't hear anything. All this, it was, it was wild. And it, my voice had gone like that. It had gotten bigger. I went from somebody who had, you know, kind of a larger voice for her age, but had iron control over it. I was going to make that voice do whatever I wanted it to do to this situation where I literally couldn't hear what was going on. And my voice teacher would say, I will tell you if something's wrong, just to keep going. So it took us about a year and a half to get me into trusting the situation and trusting not my ears, but the sensations and, and understanding that what was happening to me was not wrong and I wasn't an awful musician. Um, with that being said, I managed to miss a lot of the angst that a lot of uh, black singers go through because I did not take the traditional path. Um, I didn't do my first young artist program until after I had my first, um, until after I had my first professional contract, which ironically enough was Porgy and Bess. Um, so I didn't have any of the weird, I didn't have, I didn't understand that my blackness would be an issue. Like I, you know, you always know in the back of your head your blackness is gonna be an issue, but I didn't understand how much of an issue. I am grateful that I did that Porgy and Bess because it is like a family reunion. You meet all your cousins you didn't know you had. But also I had a lot of older singers kind of take me under their wing and tell me, this is what is coming down the pipe. Um, we talk, definitely talk to each other about what companies to sing for and what companies to leave alone. Um, you hear a lot of this company hires black singers. Um, you see a lot of, well, they have a black soprano, so they're not gonna hire any more, any other black singers, which is a thing that happens because a lot of companies it feels like are trying to meet quotas. Um, but it wasn't until I hit the professional world where I kind of experienced my first situations. Um, I remember being told that the reason I sound the way that I do is because I have extra fast twitch muscles in my throat. This is from a uh, professional somebody who charges a lot of money for people who sing at the Met to work with him. And um, I looked at him and I said, okay. And then I decided, you clearly don't know anything, don't know, any, don't know what you're talking about. So we're done here. Um, I've been told that I'm too dark to see on stage and I needed to wear a lot more makeup, not only on stage, but also um, in, in, in person like in life, because I'm so dark, I can't be seen, which started a bit of a complex. Um, but also I, uh, I also got through it, you know? I either, everybody folks will tell you I'm either barefaced or it's a full glam. Um, what comes along with that is with the makeup, um, I had to learn I, to do my own makeup. I do all of my own makeup for shows, all of it. And it is because I've had too many bad experiences with makeup artists. Um, I know people that are at the top of the game that are singing at massive, like big houses that you, that you read about, you know, in the news and stuff who still take their own foundation because what the choice the choices that are given to them by the makeup artists are not adequate. I can look at a tube of lipstick 
out of the tube and say, that is going to pull orange on me. If you put it on me, I will look like Bozo the Clown with big orange lips. And, and I, then this has happened a couple of times where people have said, no, 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 it's red. And I'm like, that is going to turn orange on me. And sure enough, they put it on me and it turns orange. So after having a couple of experiences like that, I just do my own makeup. Um, it's kind of become part of my get ready ritual. I really actually like doing my own makeup. Um, you read about people like Nicole Byer, you know, we have actors and actresses who are basically at the top of their game who have to do their own hair for TV shows because the network can't be bothered to hire somebody who knows how to do black hair. Like you're not going to spray my hair and slick it down. It's gonna do the exact opposite of that, you know? So um, we need, there need to be more people who know how to do makeup, who know how to do black hair. I will say um, other things that we have run into is the February conundrum. People love black artists in February. Um, they tend to forget that we are singers 12 months out of the year. I'm also a singer March through January. I have the exact same training as everybody else. I have gone through the same scene programs they have. I've sung the same arias they have. I sing Mozart, I sing Puccini. Um, but they tend to only think of us when they want spirituals or Porgy and Bess, which is a great show. It's a moneymaker. Companies love to program it because it always sells out, but they also don't like to program it because you have to hire outside um, chorus members because nobody's chorus is, major, is a majority black chorus. Um, so that gets really exhausting. Um, folks love, Black singers when it comes time for trauma. They love our trauma and we are much more than our trauma. We are so much more than our trauma. There are other stories that can be told. Um, Black Panther was so popular because it's a story where blackness is the rule, it's not the exception. And it is, it was, it's a relief to see a story like that where who you are is normal and, and, and isn't an exception to the rule and the thing that, that makes you stick out. You know, there have been several new operas written about Black experiences. We have the Central Park Five, or the Exonerated Five opera. Um, I believe the composer whose name completely escapes my mind right now, um, I think he wrote a Pulitzer. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure you want a Pulitzer for that. The Mets getting ready to, put, to produce uh, Fire Shut Up In My Bones, which is, um, I think, the first opera written by a Black composer they've ever done in the year of our Lord, 2021. The Met is just now doing their first Black opera. There's an opera called Blue that ha has been making waves everywhere. Um, Seattle Opera, I think, was supposed to do a production of it as well and it is um it is a, it's an opera about a young black man who has killed by a police officer and the twist is that i believe the person who killed him was his father's um partner because his father's a, a police officer too and how the family deals with that we've got an opera about the freedom writers that's been making waves there are We've got an opera about Harriet Tubman um, written by, oh man, I can't believe I didn't, it's coming. Um, but her, her suite, um, Western Washington University is doing a conversation with the author later on this, with the composer later on this month. And she's taken a, all of Harriet's arias and turned them into a suite and I've sung one of the pieces and I'm hoping to do it next year, but um, that's an important story that needs to be told. It's not just about trauma, it's about triumph as well. There are so many stories that need to be told and they're not just trauma stories. On top of that, we have opera, black opera singers kind of 
are like a family. We generally, if we don't know each other, we are one or two people separated. Oh, do you know so-and-so? Yeah, I do. Blah, blah, blah. We, um, and that's how we find, that's how I find out about new work is by seeing what other black opera singers are doing, what, what are they singing and having them, you know, and kind of, you know, talking to them and, and kind of getting mini mentored by them. I will say that the pandemic has done a lot to, uh, because everything has come to a screeching halt. My, my um, like theater was the first to shut down and we will be the last to open. And I will say that um, it's forced a lot of companies to have reckonings with their issues around race. Um, you know, there's the Black Opera Alliance, which was started by Black opera singers because of some really, really bad business practices with some major companies. Um, there needs to be more equity in, in opera and not just with singers. It's kind of demoralizing to be doing a show and it's a major, it, the cast is, is black. And then you look at the panel and by the panel, I mean, when you're, when you're rehearsing, there's a table of people and it's the director or the assistant director, the conductor, the designer, all of these people are sitting at a table and none of them are black. And so there are decisions being made about what's happening on stage that don't live up to, or, or that, that have cultural issues. Like, oh, we're gonna pour water on your, that actually happened. They were like, so what in this scene, your hair, we're gonna pour water on your hair and did it. And everybody was like, wait, what? No, 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 no. <laughs> you can't pour water on my hair and then expect me to, to just go on singing and dancing. It, there's a whole situation that happens. Um, and it's little things like that. We need conductors. We need conductors. We need composers. We need designers. We need librettists. Librettists are the people that write the stories that operas are, are or, and like the lyrics, you know, for operas. We need, um, we need artistic directors. We need staff, you know? We need just general staff in the arts. Um, we need lighting designers. I found out that I look dead when I'm lit green. I had no idea. And I didn't know this until I did a production and my <laughs> the director stopped. They were, it was a spooky scene. And the director stopped and he said, no, 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 no. We can't do this. She looks like a corpse. And I look around and everybody else looks completely mysterious. And then I looked at myself and I was like, okay, so I'm just the walking dead here. And, I, and it made me think of how many other situations I've been in or how many other productions I've been in where everybody else has been lit fine. They look great and I look atrocious. You have to light us differently. There's a reason that shows like Insecure and Moonlight look so good. It's because they have people who know how to light dark skin. You cannot light me from behind. The shadows on my face are gonna, it, it, the shape of my face and the shadows of my face, the way my face is constructed, looks different. So we need lighting designers. We need so many people. And a huge part of it is access. People think that opera isn't accessible and it is. There are outreach programs. Um, singing is free. Like voice lessons are not, but anybody can sing. Anybody can sing. You don't have to buy a violin or anything like that, but we do need emphasis on the arts. Um, it breaks my heart when I see, and I understand sports are so important to so many people, but they forget that there are students who didn't get their senior musical. There are students who didn't get their senior recital, you know, and and when it comes time to show off for other people, to show off for other um, countries, to show off for other 
um, establishments, they call the artists first. They always, always, always call us because we are a testament to what you can do as a culture. Um, one of the reasons, I'm sorry, I'm jumping back, that I chose opera also was because it, for me, is less rigid of an art form. Musical theater is very much about types. You have to fit a certain type. So though my musical theater voice may default to Disney princess, if I loved you, time and again, I would try to say all I want you to I will never be cast in that role. I will never be Julie in Carousel because I do not look like a Julie, never, unless it is a concert production, but I don't look like a Julie. I'm too dark skinned and I am too sassy looking and it just won't happen. She's an ingenue. She's sweet, she's innocent, she's all kinds of things that I will never be cast as um, in a musical theater. Versus opera, where I can be an ingenue. You know, I can walk in and sing, um, sing your escorta, sing your escorta. And, and, and it's believable. Even though I've been, you know, the story, I've been walking around with this forgotten prince and his dad, and we've been traipsing around in the wilderness or whatever, and I'm in love with him, and I won't tell him that I love him, and it makes absolutely no sense, but it's opera, so it does make sense, you know? It's, it's, it is, it, I have so much more freedom in, in opera and art song than I do in musical theater. And it's a challenge for me. It's so much more of a challenge for me because I'm curious about where my voice is gonna land. Everything else I kind of already know where it's gonna be. But with opera, with classical music, it's, it's more of a challenge. I think there need, I'm needed more there. Every time I do um, like an adjudication or a, or, like a master class with young singers. I have a friend who teaches at a school that has a high minority population. Whenever I'm there, my room fills up with students who, it, they just come and they stay. And I asked him about it and he said, they've never seen anybody that looks like you that sings like you. And that is upsetting to me. So I feel like I'm needed more in classical music and opera than I am in, in, in musical theater. Also, I mean, I can, with art song, it's like short little mini operas, you know? I could be um, any one of five of, of, of King, uh, what is it? King Henry VIII's wives, you know? I could be filled with rage. King! And I can be brokenhearted because I'm going to be killed for something that I didn't do. You know, it's, 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 it's so much more freedom for me. Um, but I'm, I'm starting to ramble and I think maybe there are some questions. There's one more video before questions. Um, over the past couple of years, uh, I would say maybe two or three years, I've somehow managed to work my way into singing mostly if not all um, works by women. Over the past year, it's morphed into works by black women um, mostly, especially Florence Price, whom I adore. So Florence Price is the first Black uh, woman composer to have her, one of her works um, played by a major orchestra. And her writing is impeccable. It's, it's amazing. And she was a contemporary of Langston Hughes. So she set uh, some of his poetry. Um, I think she was roommates with Margaret Bonds, who's, who is also a famous composer. Leontine Price loved to sing Margaret's works. Um, and we almost lost Florence's work. 
it was found um, in there was a, a house in on in Illinois that was condemned, and somebody just happened to go in and find um, and look through the attic, and they found this huge. Um, treasure trove of her works that were almost lost. And so she's had very much like a resurgence of, um, of, of her work and, and it's deserved because she's written everything from like jingles to symphonies to, um, she wrote this amazing piano, um, I think it's a concerto, and it's being premiered, I believe, by the Philadelphia Symphony. Um, and her, I have loved discovering her works, and along with her works, the work of other marginalized composers. So this uh, video, I believe, is Night. Yes, I think. Florence Price. So questions. I'm open to questions. You can ask me questions yeah. about singing, questions about being Black. Sweet. So I'll be fielding questions from the chat if people want to put it into the chat. And to open up the space with questions, I have a question. Yeah, what's up? But before that, um, thank you. You mentioned Verdi. That's really funny. I listened to Requiem last night to end my break. <laughs> um, and also thank you for the uh, recommendation on Florence Price. So my question is, from Shakespeare's Othello to Rogers and Hammerstein's South Pacific to Wicked, popular theater has many stories about racism or with racial allegories written by white writers. It also has a history of things such as the Prince of Egypt Broadway production, which was canceled after outcry of no Egyptians being cast. And instead of ca uh, casting Egyptians, they simply ended the production. With all this in mind, are blind auditions where the auditioner can't see you the norm in theater? And do they work for the lar larger famous productions? I was waiting for a blind audition question. They are not. And the, the reason is because we are not a blind art form. They do blind auditions for orchestra um, auditions. But um, we can't do blind auditions. The, what needs to happen is the panel that I mentioned, those people who are behind the table who are making the decisions about who gets cast, that needs to be more diverse. Um, yeah, the Prince of Egypt was a mess. It was a complete mess. And as soon as they announced they were doing it, and I saw the pictures, oh, Black Art Facebook was like, this is, it's not going to happen. Um, I, I don't think blind auditions is the way to go. 
at all because you need to make sure that somebody isn't just a park and bark. You need to make sure that they can actually emote and actually act. You can sound amazing and not be able to act. And that's a problem because it is a living, moving art form. Just, was that everything? Yeah, that made a lot of sense. Thank you. Yeah. So I got a question from a seven-year-old. Yay, babies! So seven-year-old says, is opera singing hard and what is hard about it? It is not hard. I don't think so. I think it is work just like any other um, singing. I don't know if you're doing, if you're in dance right now or anything like that, but if you've ever done dance or done, if you've been in, in choir at school, it's a lot of practice. You have to practice and practice and practice and then you do your performance and then it's over, right? So it sounds harder than it looks, but it, it comes so naturally that it isn't hard, it's work. There are parts of it that are hard and those are the parts that you practice, um, but it's a lot of, it's, it's so much fun. Being able to fill a room and, um, and, and being able to project your voice over an orchestra with, and you're not wearing, you're not using a microphone is honestly, the power is wonderful. You have power, um, but it's not hard. It's a lot of fun, just like any other art form. All right, from Gordon, uh, we have what percent of singing performers still can't read sheet music and only sing by ear or tone? I don't know. I can tell you classically, uh, you can't do that. You have to be able to read music. It's different, it, you have to. You have to be able to read music um, for classical singing. I, for mu some musical theater, I, the last time I was in a musical theater, uh, rehearsal everybody pulled out their phones and the like I showed up with my <laughs> like a complete nerd like I'd been trained I, I showed up with my with my uh my highlighter and my pencil and I had my score highlighted and was ready to go everybody else pulled out their phones and the recording devices and started recording because what they taught them the music in in the rehearsal which was wild to me so uh, for my world I would say it's a zero. You have to be able to read music. For pop music and for, uh, yes, thank you. My friend John says for non-reading in musical theater is probably about 40%. So, um, but for, for my world, you have to be able to read. There's just too much happening for you not to. And it's in a different, a lot, most of the time it's in a different language and you know, you're dealing with an orchestra and you have to be able to read music. It's just, it's too hard not to. Hi, I'm Altine. I use her hers. Nice to meet you. I'm, I'm so glad to see you here. And it was so eye-opening to me. I don't have a question, but the comment. So it was so eye-opening to, uh, to me to hear all the like struggles you go through as a performer because like we, I haven't thought of it and like I can relate to it because as an Asian person, I, ha I have like different hairs. So I always have problem while like coloring or like when people do my hairs or like I have droopy eyes. So you have to do the makeup differently on me. And I can, I can understand how the light lighting on the stage also works so that was like yeah like I can feel that you are not alone you are not yeah. alone <laughs> yeah and I'm also curious if if you have the YouTube channel and if you plan to like share your knowledge and like you know talk about those things to like wider audience and like let people know about the problems you face it's been suggested to me I probably will I'm just bad with technology <laughs> so uh, but it's definitely been suggested to me to do like makeup tutorials and talk about opera while I do my makeup so um yeah that's definitely a possibility I'll let folks know if it happens <laughs> that'd be great honestly <laughs> really I, I would love to see that um so from Justin where did you end up after BHS for school and or training western Woo! go Vikings <laughs> I just went to Western. 
And then I've been studying independently ever since. All right, and then from Brian, what sparked your interest in arts? Their specific song, recital, recital recording, or artist? Brian is, okay, so what Brian's not telling you is that he's the director of Seattle Art Song Society. And he has actually introduced a lot. I didn't, there's a lot of things that I have sung that Brian has handed to me and been like, no, I promise it'll be great. <laughs> he's been right and I'm so mad about it um art song I think I just had to grow into him actually I I I think what really got me going was maybe the try me good king set that's the one that is like my jewel I love that work so much but also I did a concert with sass and we did, I did some, I did the Try Me Good King and I did something else. I can't remember what it was. And I did a Nina Simone song. And Brian said to me, he goes, that's an art song. It, it is an art song. There are so many songs that are art song that are not the ones that are in these rigid, you know, French leader, um, you know, English art song categories. And so the when, once I learned that you could have as much fun in an art song as you could um, with an aria, it was done. It was done. I, I was hooked. All right. From Charlotte, they uh, say, hello, Evie, with two hearts. Hi, Charlotte. <laughs> you a professional uh, stage experience this far, thus far where you were lit properly, make up properly, et cetera. How did that feel or how would you imagine that feeling? Oh, okay. So the thing about, uh, I mean, uh, every production with Seattle Opera has been great. They know what they're doing. The thing about Porgy and Bess is everybody's brown so everybody looks fantastic. Um, and I got to, <laughs> I had two different makeup tracks that I would do one for Serena and one for one for Strawberry and Serena was a little more soft glam and so she I took a lot of selfies as Serena but there but I think yeah I think maybe the Porgy and Bess is probably my favorite oh no 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 Carmen I got to be sassy I got to get in a fight but I got to look amazing while rolling around the ground and punching my friend in the head. So that was fun. Any like super professional production that I've done has been lit really well. And they, you know, they know what they're doing. So um, that's, that's been great, but I don't know. I just, I, since I do my own makeup, I mostly like what I look like, you know, if I don't like it, I'll change it. Um, and I'm lucky that they provide me, they know I like to do my own makeup. And once I've like, you know, figured out what it's going to look like, they will provide me everything that I need makeup wise, lipstick wise, brush wise. Annette, I see, I see your question real quick. Annette wants to know, have I ever experienced hiccups while singing and how did I manage them? No. Um, my fear is yawning in the middle of a song. It's my biggest fear. And I don't know why, because I've never done it. But before I go out on stage, I have a quick conversation with my grandparents and I yawn. And then I walk out on stage every single time. I, and, even, and if I don't feel a yawn coming, I will force myself to yawn. One voice teacher said that it like lifts a soft palate, which is a whole um, technical voice thing that's good to do. But I was just like, I'm just scared I'm gonna yawn in the middle of a song. So I just do it to get out of, my, to get out of the way. <laughs> Janice, I'm trying not to yawn right now. I don't want to get lipstick on my teeth. Any other questions? I don't think so. Maybe. Yeah, there's the one about favorite, uh, most memorable, memorable um, stage, I think. I saw that one coming. Most memorable. Oh, yes. Most memorable, memorable place or hall I've performed. Oh. Um, there's something about walking into McCaw Hall and looking and seeing all of those seats. And it looks like something, it, it's like the you see it and you're like, oh my gosh, this is what it looks like on TV. 
you know, it's just amazing. Um, Macaw is my favorite. There is a church in South Seattle that is all stone and the acoustics in that are amazing. It was built for the soprano voice. I sound like a million bucks in there. And then also uh, I love performing at uh, Lake Wald Gardens. Their acoustics in there are amazing and it's a beautiful setting. And hopefully, you know, the next project that we're doing is good. That's where the last piece was recorded at. Um, Snejana is asking me, sorry, if I could tell you guys about my experience learning Russian while I had to prepare for Eugene Onegin. Snejana did not learn Russian. I learned how to sound Russian. Um, it's the most terrifying, hard thing I've ever had to do. <laughs> it's so hard. There's so many vowels that end up like back here. And I was just like, I had to fake my way through it. I did not learn Russian. It's definitely a language I need to work on because Tchaikovsky's written some amazing roles, but it was hard, but it was so much fun. It was such a fun show to do. It's a fun language to sing in because there's so much to like chew on and work with, but woof. Oh, it's hard. It's, I was sweating after every like rehearsal, just like, you guys, what did we just say? Oh, wow. I'm so impressed. Like, so were you Tatiana? Or? No, I had to sing Tatiana's aria for the, um, I, for the, they did a preview concert and I sang Tatiana's aria and it's a smooth eight, nine, eight. No, 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 no. Tatiana's aria is, I think, 17 pages long and we cut it to like seven I told him I was like I can't do this <laughs> I can't my mouth won't do this I don't have time to learn it I'm so sorry and we chopped it into pieces and still I was like ah, no! <laughs> but it was fun 20 pages yep Kim's right 20 pages. Oh, it does repeat. But even with the, when you cut out the repeats, it's still 15. It was all so hard. Any other questions? I think we're out of time. Uh, if you, I'm just curious. Have you heard about the singer named Dimash? No. He's he's getting pretty famous. Uh, like he, I'm from Kazakhstan, so he's also like from Kazakhstan, and like people are getting by about his voice. If you can check it out, <laughs> I've never heard of him. I used to be into this Turkish pop singer named um, Tarkan. Oh yeah, I know Tarkan. Friends yeah. and I were <laughs> he's we were amazing. Obsessed. We used to break into our one friend's apartment. We weren't really breaking and entering. We had a key. Um, go in because he had the largest computer monitor, and we would just watch Tarkan videos and eat his food. <laughs> but um, I haven't heard of him. I'll definitely look him up. Um, but it was, <sighs> yeah. Any other questions? Any requests to be sung out? Sing us out? Oh, um, okay. <laughs> I don't... Um. She's an opera there. singer. Thank <laughs> you so much, Edie. This has been lovely. And Thank you. Um, Thank you for having me. And a shout out again to Bellingham Public Schools, Student, of, um, Student Life's Office, um, Simpsons Intercultural Center, and Teaching and Learning Center that we've been doing all the celebration of Black excellence throughout the month. So you just come out, come tomorrow. One of our students is going to do a Black acknowledgement presentation and then on Friday we had Chuck Berry's um, I think grandson or something. Thank you everyone for coming. Bye everybody. So long.